Welcome. This is the Ralph Bivens Project. I'm Ralph Bivens. We, we're here today to talk about something that's been the headlines a lot, uh, Disney. Uh, you've heard about it, read about it, and uh, it's, that's, that's kind of our topic today. It's going to be Disney's real estate empire, which is impressive, and it's, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in, uh, about what happened here. You know, we were talking about several things that just got it started with, you know, I guess the biggest secret land assemblage ever completed in the United States or anywhere, really, as conducted by Walt Disney himself. He was overseeing it. It wasn't doing deals. He's, they were keeping it secret. And they, after he built, the, opened the Disneyland in, in 55 in Anaheim, California, then he said, we need to have an East Coast location. So they began blocking up land and uh, 51 different uh, acquisitions. And some of this he got for $100 a foot. It's pretty amazing. And he ended up with 28,000, almost 28,000 acres, which of course is uh, it's about the size of the Woodlands Master Plan community here. If you're in Texas, you know about it. it it's pretty huge. It's a lot of land. And what they've done there since then is uh, pretty amazing. You know, they brought in, for one thing, they brought in star architects like, you know, Philip Johnson and, and Michael Graves, uh, Cesar Pelli. These guys did a, did a community which, uh, you know, got, was kind of a, an advanced new urbanism, which uh, uh, we've talked about it a lot. And, and I think there's a lot of lessons there to be learned. But with this 28,000 acres, Mr. Disney told state officials he needed his own municipal government, more or less. And with that, he was going to also create a futuristic city. And that was going to be part of it, this new futuristic city. Um, and so from there, uh, this is where we are today. So I'm, we're lucky to have Mary Shanklin, an independent journalist based in the Orlando area. She's uh, done a lot of work on real estate development, land development, residential and commercial construction. She knows a lot about the taxes there. She knows, she, she knows this issue all like the back of her hand. So, Mary, thank you so much for signing on today. Always a pleasure, Ralph. I, um, I appreciate the intro and I appreciate how knowledgeable um, you are about, um, you know, the whole deal of the assemblage and, um, you know, really kind of some historic game changers that really probably did change um, you know, the way that, that we look at, at land development um, and, you know, it, it even affects how large scale developments are, are done today. It was it was, you know, really one of the first. Well, I, I think it is um, certainly the only one in Florida and I'm not aware of any outside of Florida where they set up their own government, um, you know, in order to handle all. Um, basically, one of the reasons they got that that acreage for so little was because um, we we have a lot of swamp land in, in Florida and um, it needed um, massive, um, massive amounts of drainage and, and um, you know, the permitting, the environmental permitting. And so, you know, by, by putting this under um, the Disney umbrella, um, you know, they were able to control all, all of that. That's, it's a lot of land to control and it's a lot of responsibility to control if you're talking about redeveloping swampland and putting in utilities and, and all of those things, so a big deal. Um, right. I, I think, um, you know, when you, when you go back, if you were going to look at the textbook of, um, you know, well, what, what we learned and how it affects, um, you know, how we look at development today, um, you know, like the, the later version of that, um, you know, you, you don't you don't see companies, you don't see, you know, the Amazons and the Googles, um, you know, or, or any of your, your oil companies um, being able to create their own governments and, and collect their own taxes. 
But what you do see are um, the taxing districts and the community development districts. And so that's kind of the, the latter day version of that. And, um, you know, that's become a great funding tool and you know, to enable them to, to amass um, great portions of land, the money to develop it. Right. It's, it's, it's a lot to, to bite off and chew there at the beginning of, with talking about installing all these utilities and preparing all this land. And it's a long time to wait before revenue starts coming in, you know. Uh, yeah, a long time to wait. And um, yeah, to your point, um, you know, what they were able to do, which now um, all these years later, you know, a half century from when, um, you know, Walt envisioned what he had called at the time EPCOT um, uh, was an acronym for Experimental Prototype Community Um but but before he got to launch it, when he just had the vision of it, um, you know, he was able to, um, you know, put that into play with these um, taxing districts that um, would really probably be unheard of today because of their, you know, there's a lack of transparency, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what governments, you know, usually have to, you know, to, to show. <clears throat> but um, but now um, that's that's all come to issue as um, you know in the headlines all over the, the country we've seen um, um, Disney um, Disney became vocal about um, Governor Florida Governor Ron DeSantis um, pushed forward this um, don't say gay legislation um, that really dictated um, for our education system. Um, you know, you know, the language that, that educators and textbooks could use. And so um, Disney, which um, employs a lot of people in the LGBTQ um, community, um, um, you know, did become vocal about this. And, um, you know, I think some of its I mean, and staff members um, or, or cast members, as they call them, um, you know, really pushed upper management on, on this. And, and so, you know, Disney did enter into, um, you know, that, um, that conversation, um, you know, much to the dismay of the governor who then, um, you know, decided that, um, you know, well, that Disney maybe didn't need this, um, as it's called the Reedy Creek Improvement District, and that um, it was, you know, created by the state. And so, um, you know, he looked at it as though, well, then the state can can undo it. You know, what the state giveth, the state can take it away. And I guess they did. Um, the legislature well, voted on it and the governor signed the bill just a few days ago. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, you know, these things happen and, and there has been some discussion about, you know, well, you know, could this be co political grandstanding on something that, you know, you know, might not become effective. Um, you've got, um, you know, what what um, Disney was able to do by, um, you know, collecting these ad valorem taxes. Um, so then they're able to issue bonds, which, as you know, um, you know, that is, you know, the gravy and the engine of, of large scale development. And um, they issued um, the ad valorem, um, the property tax bonds and also the utility bonds. So um, now the bondholders are, um, you know, looking at a lawsuit because, you know, they're, they're looking at language where, um, you know, you know, the state had agreed to um, in no way alter um, the, the pledge and um, the pledge on those bonds and, and the district itself. So um, I, I, I feel like it's, it's likely to head um, to the courts. Um, and, and meanwhile, then you have the local government scrambling, um, you know, to try to figure out, you know, well, if we inherit this bond debt, you know, what is that going to look like? You know, what's our pledge on that? Um, already you may have seen um, Fitch downgraded um, the, the bond ratings, um, you know, that Disney held on that. So, um, you know, that that in itself, it could be a, a legal cause for, for the bondholders. It's got to be, it's got to, you're right, though. How can this happen without 
serve a lawsuit. <laughs> so, so many people have money tied up, bondholders and everybody else. So that's uh, really pull the rug out from under everything, I guess. Yeah. Under everything. Um, you know, um, I think that one of the, um, everybody kind of thinks, many, so many people think of D you know, the theme parks and all, but as you well know, because um, you were there really kind of at the formation of it, you know, part of that initial 28,000 acres was um, this, this celebration development. Mm -hmm. And um, that ended up, so that's not affected by this because um, Disney then backed that out of the Reedy Creek Improvement District in part because, um, if you're if you're a landholder in that district, then you get a vote, you know, and, and you could you could do things like vote to dismantle it or whatever. So in order to um, retain control, um, you know, they 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 carved out that property for celebration, which, you know, became many stories in, in and of itself. Yeah, it, it was a springboard, you know, for for in a lot of ways this the awareness of new urbanism and what it stood for and what the principles were. And, um, can, can you tell us a little bit about new urbanism? Yeah, you know, um, I agree with you that it was um, not the front runner, but I think that it was, um, it was probably like the most high profile front, front runner. And, um, it was actually um, Peter Calthorpe um, was the one who um, helped, you know, he helped um, create that initial design um, and, and did the planning for that. And, and so in order to do this, this was during the era when um, Disney was headed by, um, I think he was a household name at the time, Michael Eisner. And um, this was gonna be kind of his, his signature project. And so um, residentially, um, he went to, um, he sent people to like coastal towns along the Atlantic, um, to northeastern towns. They would do things like measure the distance from the sidewalk to the front porch, you know, from the little picket fence out front, um, you know, to the front door. And, um, you know, then they put together like a pretty extensive playbook on um, this um you know, as, as it's been, you know, called now, um, new urbanist, um, new urbanist design, you know, which really reflects on, um, you know, more historic, um, um, more historic um, styles of housing architecture. And I, I think that they've got about a half dozen different um, styles and designs. But um, it is interesting that, you know, with the, the Disney, not only did they, you know, really kind of set the course, you know, by doing, you know, this, you know, their own government, their own tax, um, figuring out a way to, you know, get the bonds and, and get the bond pledges, you know, but then they also figured out, you know, well, how we could make this signature community, which, you know, as you noted on your intro, um, beyond the residential piece, Michael Eisner came in with, um, you know, these really boutique brand name architects. And, and so what happened, um, they, they put celebration on, um, it is, it is probably one of the tackiest sections of, of road in in the United States, um, US 192. And it was back at the day when, um, you know, families would like, you know, travel and, you know, it's filled with all these cheap hotels, some of which, you know, kind of like, you know, now house people coming out of, of homelessness and, and what have you. And so that that is the front door of celebration. And I think that Eisner realized by, by bringing in these, you know, renowned, internationally renowned architects that, that you could get away with, you know, like this, this signature community, you know, on a piece of property that's, you know, got some pretty marginal neighbors to say the least. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember being on a tour there and, you know, I, you were probably there too. A bunch of us uh, toured it. It was new, you know, it was new, very new. And, uh, but I think it turned out to be a, a major success. It won a major Urban Land Institute award, uh, got a lot of publicity and, uh, you know, yeah, 
I, th I, I think you're right about, you know, maybe it had, uh, you know, Calthorpe got, got a lot of notice for it, but um, it really put, having Disney do it, it put it on the map and just popularized the, the concepts there to, you know, broad extent. Yeah. Was negligent in mentioning um, Robert A.M. Stern was, um, you know, pretty central to that. But you know what's interesting, Ralph, um, do you remember on the tour, um, then, um, you know, there on the waterfront, um, there is Cesar Pelli did this retro looking theater. And so just as an anecdote to, to how it's fared, like the residential in there, particularly the single family, it's outperformed um, single family in, in the overall metro area. But um, that, that real estate, the commercial piece, not as much, you know, and it, it's based on that model where instead of putting like your main street where all the traffic goes by on that really tacky strip of, of 192, you know, you put it where it's just walkable to that interior community. And, you know, I've seen it in other examples and it has happened here where, um, you know, not all that retail has, has done well. The mm -hmm. Caesar Pelly um, theater, um, it, it was closed. It may still be closed for like a decade, which, you know, really, um, you know, is a function of a lot of movie theaters, but, um, you know, it's, it's just so, so well done. And other stores have kind of come in, and gone in there. So, you know, it, it also, I think when you look at like, you know, textbook examples of, of what Disney has done there, um, they're popping out another um, major development in California. I think it's called Story Living. And, and it's gonna be interesting to see you know, if they follow, you know, that same concept where, you know, you put your retail instead of, you know, like on the busy corridor streets on the boundaries, you know, you tuck it on the inside just for the residents. Yeah, the, the story living, uh, you know, that's their new, they just rolled this out this year. The first one is going to be in Southern California, yeah. uh, but it's, it's master plan communities with, with a Disney theme, a lot of Disney uh, thoughts in there and concepts and, and some they're not going to have Mickey Mouse walking around, but but some of the some of that programming, I guess, to some certain extent, will will be infused into the community. And it, it's it's I don't know what they, they have. By the way, DMB development uh, based out of Scottsdale, Arizona, is, is really going to be involved a lot in the, in the land plan, the real estate development, and they've done a lot of some pretty major master plans. And, uh, you know, they, they just started something in Houston, but, but some, with their, uh, I think maybe having actual practitioners, real estate developer practitioners involved heavily, maybe they will not have, uh, some of the things go wrong that you know, celebrations seem to have uh, when it may have been, you know, more maybe too much in house there. But but it was no, right. it's still it's still fantastic. I don't know where else they say they're going to pull these out of not just California, but a, across the nation with this story living. Um, I'd be interested to see where they go. Um, yeah, you know. Um they they also had Disney had great success with the Golden Oak community um, that also um, was developed near um, near the parks and and it's almost like a um, higher brand version of Story Living where you know it's it's multi million dollar price of entry and. Um, you know, you have to go through two guarded gates to get in there, but, you know, a chauffeur will come and pick up you and your grandchildren and, you know, and take you to early entry at the parks. And I think they realize, you know, there's so much success, so many, um, you know, people in love with that brand that, um, you know, it could drive a, a bigger 
you know, it's it's that thematic living that we've seen um, in in Florida. Um, the the Jimmy Buffett's Margarita Bill, like they mm-hmm. cannot build enough of them, and it is the lottery, and and it is you know where uh, you know people fall in love with a brand and and they'll and invest in it. You know they'll you know that's that's where they they see themselves living, and probably celebration. You know was was one of the the early versions of that. It's going to be interesting to see where it all comes out. And the uh, uh, new urbanism with them is something else. And, and also, you know, we, uh, you know, I did want to take a second since we're kind of on that topic. Um, you know, Andres Duani, the Florida, Miami, Florida architect that uh, you know, did really some successful projects with new urbanism, including, you know, Seaside there. Um, which you know, anybody remember the Truman Show movie with um, who was the star of that show? But it was a good movie, filmed there, and it got a lot of exposure. But Duane was uh, is certainly a key figure in this new urbanism thing, which, of course, uh, like you said, has uh, trying to restore communities into what they were and where people connected with the, the the people around them and the streets weren't so set back so far that you could sit on your front porch and talk to people your neighbors walking by on the sidewalk you, know, you could walk places walkable a huge thing you know it, it is a lot of social engineering um going on with um, those designs and, you know, they want to bring together people, you know, at the community garden and, um, you know, you know, create, you know, they, they make the lots smaller. And then, you know, one of the trade-offs is um, more um, common areas, you know, for, for, um, you know, kids to, you know, play flag football or, or whatever. Uh, we're the, you know, okay. Uh, the, <laughs> New urbanism probably started, what, uh, 30 years ago? Maybe a little bit before that. I didn't really have a birthing point like a you know, declaration of independence or anything. Yeah. But, hey, we're thinking about it now and we're saying, well, uh, new urbanism is, has been aging. So what happens next? What, what do you think is the next step for well, you know, I think that there was a lot of conversation during the pandemic about, um, you know, the idea behind behind new, new urbanism, which, you know, there was the Congress of New Urbanism um, that um, Duani was, um, you know, a central character in. Um, but, um, you know, I think during the pandemic, there was a lot of conversation about, oh, you know, we, we don't want to, you know, go out and play flag football. And, you know, oh, I'm not sure that, you know, we want those neighbors wandering up to the porch and all. And so I think that the, in the test of time, we're going to see if, if that attitude was a blip or if that has staying power. You know, if it, if it evolves into something where, you know, there's more emphasis on, you know, you know, limited public spaces and then you know, more places where, um, you know, you can isolate. I, I think, um, you know, and then as, as land prices go up, I think it's going to be, um, you know, kind of more, more, you know, take on like a more multifamily look, mm-hmm. you know, not so much the um, front porches, but, you know, could be balconies. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think those are some of the, the big issues, just, you know, a sense of, you know, the balance, the line between um, privacy and um, self-containment and, and how, how do you maximize, um, you know, your, your costs, you know, as land prices go up? Mm-hmm. What know. do you think? What do you think? I also think, you know, you know, well, you know Brent Harrington at DMB has some ideas about, well, we've, we've, he, he, you know, he's a new urbanist guy in his land planning and developments, but he also said, well, a lot of it's focused on the street. A lot of things are focused on the strip of concrete in front of your house where cars are going by all the time. And so he's saying, what would happen if um, 
that there was green in front of the houses, that there were pathways and bike trails. And it, it's not going to be about cars in front of the house. It's going to be about other modes of transportation. You bring the cars around the back through the alleys. Let's have all the houses facing, perhaps, into this green space. This, this, these transportation corridors that aren't meant for automobiles. And truly having a walkable community, because I, I think that's what everybody's shooting for right now is walkable communities. I haven't seen his final thing. I haven't seen his final thing, but uh, in terms of a land plan or whatever, but that's what he's describing. I'm interested to see how this comes out. And he's, he, of course, is working on yeah, that story. You know Right. Yeah. Um, you know, that is the conversation, um, you know, with, um, you know, behind the whole autonomous vehicles that, um, you know, that ultimately in the long view, you know, maybe you don't own two cars, maybe you don't own one car. And then, you know, like in, in like the big picture, I don't know how futuristic it is, but you know, somebody, you know, a car, you know, comes up at a certain time of day. I mean, it does sound kind of, um, you know, kind of a bit sci-fi, but, um, you know, I mean, look at how many Teslas that you see on, on the road now. And I, you know, the, 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 um, pace of change is so much faster than it used to be that, you know, what used to seem, you know, so long-term, you know, in housing development, you know, I mean, you know, now, now you have to put electric charging stations in, in garages and. That's the next thing <laughs> you need to, Think about that. There is a guy in Houston. It's uh, Aronson. Um, is doing a a lot of this, putting in going to multifamily units, and saying we can put in chargers. Your 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 residents in the multifamily projects are going to want to be able to charge their cars overnight, and we can do that for you. And that that seems like there's tremendous amount of growth potential on that score. <laughs> Man, you talk about got 300 units right there, and uh, who knows? But in 10 years, the percentage of you know, electric vehicles is going to be huge. Yeah, it's definitely going to change the dynamic of um, you know multifamily and um, single family. You know what's you know you know the, the shape of garages, and um, you know if. if you know, people are buying their 80,000 Tesla, you know, you know, well, you know, do you have, you know, three car garages anymore? You know, that that's kind of where it is right now, but, but maybe, you know, it's kind of becomes a boomerang. Our lessons, uh, you know, when we're looking back, uh, this is a hard question uh, that we're thinking about. We look at this, all these things that Disney has done, what Walt Disney did, um, what they put on the ground. And uh, when you're looking back now and you're from, well, not now, but maybe 20 or 30 years from now, and you look back at this and say, wow, they really had, had that right. Or, well, you know, maybe they should have not taken that path. What do you say about what happened? In, in well, I, I think... Um, like, you know, when, when you look back on, on the projects, how they did it, that um, what they could be studied for is taking what was a, a very like marginal um, swath of land to begin with, and then um, sculpting it with, um, you know, retention ponds and, um, and um, you know, kind of like not high traffic um, corridors, and and um, and and streets and highways that that aren't you know don't have um, retail along them. I think um, you know ultimately you know my guess is I mean I, I don't know what it'll look like, but the way it's headed now, you know the fact that um, you know you go to these places, you know you go to, you look at Disney property and what they've developed, Celebration and Golden Oak, and you know one thing that you don't see is office. And, um, you know, I think looking back, you know, that could be considered, you know, that, well, that was, you know, a wise move. You know, you don't have 
like a vacant, there, there was some office in, in celebration. There, there was um, a couple high rises, maybe like about um, 12 stories tall. But, you know, Disney can, can largely fill those. But I, I do think, you know, looking back right now, we have learned so much from the pandemic. And I'm sure you've had shows on this that, um, you know, office, um, you know, the retailers have kind of figured out, you know, oh, if I'm going to get shoppers in here, you know, I got to tart up this place, you know, I got to, you know, make it an interesting place. But I think ultimately, um, when when you look back on what Disney has done, you know, lot of this is probably going to, you know, be applauded. That That's one thing, um, you know, reshaping um, a swamp into, um, you know, a very livable area. Um, that's going to be a, another plus, um, you know, the taxing districts. Um, I don't, I don't think that they really got that right. I mean, I, I feel like we can look at that now and see that, you know, that's become a political bone of contention. Um, so, you know, if I had to pick like a couple of, you know, things maybe that they got right and maybe they didn't, that, that's, that's what I would pick. Right. Yeah. The taxing district sure uh, became controversial and maybe they were given too much authority. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, at least they got Disney there. Um, when you're, if you're thinking about it from an economic development standpoint, they, Disney came and there was swamp. And I don't know what the population was of Orlando at that time, but a major explosion of growth. And now it's just everything. It's not just people come for vacation. It's conventions and hotel. Just it's tremendous. And vacation right. sales. It's amazing. Yeah, you know, I, I I feel like also like just in terms of site selection, um, you know, the the lessons there, you know, at that time it was like, oh, you know, you've got to be on the coast. Oh, you've got to be proximate to the beach. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, well, I mean, quite honestly, the 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 Atlantic Ocean is is rising, and um, you know, the coastal properties, um, the insurance is insane, and um, you know, by by really like separating themselves from, you know, the, the um, conventional wisdom of the day, being near the coast, you know, they figured out, you know, by having our own government, by controlling everything so that we can, you know, make the swamp look like a beautiful place, um, you know, they made a huge play and, and, and people responded. You know, another example of that is, um, like just a little bit north of there is the villages, which is it's the number one master plan community in the United States every single year, year in, year out. It is as robust now as it ever was. And it's a similar thing where instead of going to the coast where you would have thought that it was happening, you know, they were able to like recreate. So I feel like it's a story of, of site selection and, and kind of going off the page a little bit. That's a great point. And of course, you know, sea level rise keeps happening. Orlando could be a coastal city before we know it. <laughs> but but they but you're really right. I mean, when you're thinking about when Disney's flying over, and I know he was flying over a lot of land with these people and they said, Well, I want to be near you know, some major freeways and um, a lot of road access, significant road access, but it, but Orlando is not, you know, it, it gets pretty hot there in August. You know, it's just not the garden spot that well, Southern California is pretty nice weather. Most of the time, you have some fires, but you know, it's not uh, temperature-wise. It doesn't get as radical as. Some of the Sun Belt cities over here, and you think, wow, that that, that actually worked, and we're thinking. Yeah, like, you know, um, interesting to your point, uh, Ralph. Um, there just had been like a few months ago, um, Disney had announced that it was going to be moving um, major chunks of its corporate headquarters from Anaheim. You know, kind of like you know, 
you know, a, a, a nicer, more temperate area than like our, our humid, humid um, summer place here to mm -hmm. the Orlando area. And so, you know, how that goes and if leases are signed and if there's backlash from from all this DeSantis thing, you know, that that remains to be seen. But but your point is excellent, um, like in terms of like our, the site selection idea, you know, he did fly over it. And um, it was um, we learned in, in one of our Nary um, meetings long ago um, from and it was an appraiser who talked about, you know, where where to go. Um, you know, that, that your property is going to go up in value. And it was, you know, well, where they're, um, you know, putting in highways, where they're you know, where that, you know, that that's, you know, that's really the, the place to look. Well, yeah, I mean, there, <clears throat> was, was there an Air Force base uh, around this uh, at one time? Okay, or, so... Or, um, Okay, the oddest thing of all, and this will tell you the power of, of politics. Um, so in the in the Orlando area, um, which is landlocked, um, somehow um, a, a congressman with a lot of sway a long time ago was able to get a Navy base <laughs> put in, uh, you know, really, it would be like putting a Navy base in the middle of Texas. We well, put one in a, outside of Omaha or something, right? Exactly. And so um, just to go full circle with it, um, well, ultimately, another congressman, you know, you know, I think it was, you know, a, an entire administration said, you know, we need to do some base closings. So so guess what came up, you know, up on the, the high up on the list? It was the landlock one in Orlando. And and so then um, the, the mayoral administration had decided, well, instead of trying to do like some Central Park thing, um, we're going to let the Pritzker family in um, Chicago um, develop this um, in a new urbanist style. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, that became um, Baldwin Park and, mm -hmm. and fell on um, some of the, the similar patterns as Celebration, which like the, the main shopping corridor, it wasn't on the periphery. And, and it struggled for a long time. Like that, the, the best retail location, floor to ceiling, glass looking in, you know, just, just crying out, you know, for customers and all, you know, they would turn that into like a gymnastic studio, which could be in an industrial area, you know, just, just to get, you know, something going in there. And, and it, it's kind of evolved a little bit more, but um, I think, you know, Disney's celebration also, you know, kind of affected this, this whole region. And I'm sure you probably have new urbanist communities in um, the Houston area. We do some, you know, and it's parts of it, you know, they uh, will, you know, bar certain things here, bar certain things there. And I think everybody, though, I, the one thing that seems to really resonate coming out of new urbanism has been you know, this walkable. Everybody wants a walkable project. They want, um, and I think that's going to grow as people are more concerned about, um, you know, health and being able to walk places, being able to conserve energy, uh, just the, uh, it's the green lifestyle of you know, being able to walk to a grocery store, get your stuff, and you know, come back home without too much trouble. Uh, that's, I, I think that whole deal is going to. It's going to. It's a part of us now, and it's going to be more so. And, and I, <laughs> the movement to the suburbs. That's been the, the far suburbs. That's been. The, quite an idea that's changed during the during the pandemic. We've had a lot more land sales to like subdivision developers and master plan community developers way, way out on the edge of town. And because people, for one thing, they said, well, I don't have to go into work every day. I can work from home. And the whole work from home thing uh, has, has changed a lot of the land planning and the ideas people have for new residential communities even if they're not going to, okay, well, now maybe, you know, COVID has died down mostly a bit. So, but you're still going to, don't have to come to work five days a week. And so the commuter out there, 
you know, 50 miles from downtown or from where their office is, they, they think, well, you know, if I only have to drive in to work two or three days a week, then I'll go ahead and I'll move way out and, and I can find affordable housing that's, uh, you know, built on land that doesn't cost so much. And, um, so I think that has changed a lot of ideas about location. But, you know, then of course, <laughs> Five dollar gasoline is, or four dollar gasoline, whatever we're paying right now, has, has changed the the picture too. So, I, I know you know the other thing that did is, um, you know, you mentioned like walkability to the grocery store and all, but um, you know, well, you know, my parents get their groceries delivered. Oh, there we go. Yeah. That's a huge thing. You know, the whole upheaval in. Yeah, that, um, you know, all of a sudden then the suburbs, you know, well, you're not so far away. You can get, you know, everything brought to your doorstep and, you know, save you, you time and money. And, you know, I don't know the I don't know the transportation system in Houston, but I'll tell you in the Orlando area, the only way that they expand the road network is with tolls. And so then on top of gasoline prices, you know, the you know, people you know, are taking on like these expensive toll prices. And so, um, you know, it, it is, um, you know, it is an offset to be able to save money, you know, and, and move further out. I, your heart breaks for like this generation of, of new buyers coming in where, you know, the wages just um, haven't risen like, like the home prices have. And, you know, to me, that's going to, you know, have to, be some creative solutions too, um, you know, whether it's new urbanism, you know, giving up a car payment or, or what it is. Well, it's, ama it's, it's amazing the way it changed Florida. And um, I don't think Disney is going to pack up and move. Yeah. Where, where they come through with the uh, moving people from the Anna Anaheim offices, uh, that that deal might get delayed, but um, but it, it's going to be there for a while, and it's changed a lot of things. And you know, a lot of people just don't think outside the box that much. We like, hey, we're going to a swamp, and I don't know if Mister Disney had it really understood the amount of change that this was going to happen, that it was going to just build a tourism industry and change the city um, to this extent, this fast, you know, it was not long. Um, so I think areas that are, you know, cities that are down, maybe they say, well, we don't have anything. You know, we, we don't have anything you know, beautiful around here. We don't have an ocean. We don't have mountains. Um, so why would anybody come here for a vacation? Uh, why, why could, how could we ever have any tourism industry? How, how would you ever do vacation sales here? But Orlando did it. Orlando did it. And now it's a great place to go. I always enjoy going there. I go there for the conventions and uh, all the time. Yeah, I, I think that um, you've seen um, firsthand also how um, it can be like a victim of its own success where, um, you know, like I think it is now um, the largest um, convention center in the United States. And um, man, like the road network um, really doesn't, you know, hasn't responded to that. And, and that's created a lot of issues. And we're late on the um, commuter rail. Um, but um, I will say, you know, that transit oriented development, um, you know, Disney had, you know, kind of resisted that, you know, being connected to anything that could take their customers away. But now we have um, um, the bright line coming in from um, Miami to Orlando and, and Disney's going to be a stop there. And I feel like um, the organization is. Um, you know, being more flexible and more farsighted because, you know, we didn't touch on that with like walkability. It's also, um, you know, it's also transit and, you know, people, people aren't as in love with the buses, you know, it, it's, it's that commuter rail, you know, they, they have an idea that it's, you know, it's cleaner and it's safer and, you know, there's a, a little more distance. 
And Brightline, Brightline goes all the way to Miami, uh, doesn't it? And Miami to Orlando. Or right, right. And then, and then, um, then from um, Orlando to Tampa. Oh, so, so. Um, you know, that is, um, oh, probably like about 80% done now. So um, slowly but surely good. they're pushing transit. They could do a lot with, uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk, one of his companies, uh, the Boring Company, has built a um, a tunnel, you know, a transportation tunnel connecting the convention center in Las Vegas uh, down to the Strip and, and stuff. Um, I've seen it. I haven't been in it yet. But, but you would think that some kind of transportation system around the the massive convention center um, in Orlando would be a, a good thing to have. We've got yeah, you know, um, it actually was Richard Branson, um, you know, um, you know, Sir Richard Branson, who he he bankrolled the Bright Line um, because the state, you know, couldn't really get it together to to do anything like that. Who's paying for the one in Vegas to connect it with the the retail, the convention center to the retail strip? Yeah, yeah. I think it had municipal backing too, but you know, uh, Musk, yeah. Musk, Musk is doing it, you know, which yeah. and his his boring company is really uh, getting it on. They're they're really expanding rapid rate. They have pretty serious discussion right now in San Antonio, connecting downtown San Antonio to its airport. They have had pretty serious discussions in Fort Lauderdale, and I think there's something in some smaller version of suburban Austin on a community called Kyle, K-Y-L-E. Um, that, mm -hmm. And he's moved his, you know, headquarters from of the Boring Company to Pflugerville, which is a suburb of Austin. It, Tesla's now in Austin. And we're, I mean, the governor of Texas has been tweeting in recent days saying, hey, why don't you move the, the headquarters of Twitter to Austin, too? Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so, I mean, getting, no matter what you think of Elon Musk, he, he's a creative guy that is like having your own one-man economic development corporation. You know, he's bringing in so many companies and everything. But, but the, uh, and of course, but Tesla's the big one. they got a big factory there, and that's, the faster they crank out those cars, they they're selling fast. They have a huge market share. And yeah, it's, it's a company to watch. I I will say, um, you know, Austin has that beautifully diverse um, economy, um, but um, man, it's another victim of its own success because it just simply does not have the transportation network mm -hmm. um, to to move people. It's um, you know, it's just it's just exploded faster than than the government can possibly keep up with. They they didn't prepare enough for with the um, transportation infrastructure. Just I think they don't have a, a, a really good loop. You know, freeways aren't there. Mm -hmm. The the rail they put in, uh, you know, don't just didn't have good enough transportation. It's like. It goes to a community called Leander, which, and that's like the only place it goes. And there's only several hundred, you know, people riding it a day. It's or something. It, it's less. I don't know the specifics, but it's less than a smash hit. So they they are behind on that. And the more that they bring these companies in, uh, the further behind they get. In just the month of April, they've had a. a Tremendous amount of new office product uh, projects being proposed, and some of them started construction in downtown Austin. A 70 story, which is Lincoln property, uh, wow. and then a, a 40 story and 45 story, 48 story, something like that. But three car properties, one of them. But three buildings in just the last three, because the office market is so strong in Austin. and. And when they fill those, but they've been getting tenants. You know. Facebook just leased you know, 600,000 square feet in downtown Austin. Google's new building's almost completed. 
you know, Apple and, and all the you know, TikTok, all these tech companies are now establishing big presence there. So it really does represent a shift um, from from Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas. Right. Are they doling out um, economic incentives? Because um, man, across the country, like all these, you know, you know, little or mid-sized towns would love to have any any of them. And and they throw out the dollars. Remember when Amazon was looking for its headquarters too, which kind of became a little bit of a joke. And and everybody wanted to be a player there. But but I, I'm just wondering if it, I can't imagine that Austin is doing a lot of incentives, you know, with the, with so much growth, you know, just knocking at its door. You know, I, I think the Tesla plant may have did get some the Tesla plant and it. And the Samsung, they Samsung's building the seventeen billion dollar chip manufacturing plant. Um, so th some of those big manufacturing plants have uh, definitely gotten help from the government. I don't know about the office space. Uh, there may be something, but I not I haven't seen a lot of that. I think it's more the manufacturing, but it's worked, and they're, they're scoring the big companies and. And they have the workforce there to support it. You know, the tech workforce that, right. you, know, you know, I'm going to leave my job at Facebook and go to work at Apple just down the road. You know, so, I know like people that. in Austin complain about uh, as if it is to buy, but boy, everybody pouring in there from Silicon Valley is saying, what a deal. Uh, yeah, they do. And, you know, 30%, one year over year, 30%. Increase in in housing prices in Austin, and you that's know, where we're at. We're we're at twenty nine percent. Yeah, it we'll just it's a, we'll see how long all this lasts, and we'll yeah, see. What I, I don't really see it sustaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah Kim, it was, but but we we'll also be watching for um, uh, Disney. Um, I guess that that's that's what we started off at, and um, we'll see how this controversy how it ends and what happens between now and then, but it's um, interesting to watch. And um, so I'm really so glad you, you could find time to talk with me today and everything. It's Always a pleasure, Ralph. Always. <laughs> they, you, you're great. You know everything over there. So we'll, maybe we'll have, you can come back someday when we, uh, when we have some more big, Orlando Disney questions. And, uh, okay. I'm, I'm up for it. Okay. Thank you, Mary Shanklin. Yep. And, yep. Uh, we will talk to you again soon, I hope. Sounds good. Take care. Bye-bye.